So I want to talk about two different sets, or two, two different groups of solutions to the Stokes flow equations. And I'm going to group them in terms of boundedness. The reason why I group them in terms of boundedness of the domain is that solutions in an unbounded domain lead us to one specific form of mathematical approach. Solutions in a bounded domain lead us to a different mathematical approach. In particular, we will find that multipolar solutions, because they are, because they are infinite in extent, and because they're convenient ways of describing the effect of a single entity, for example, a single particle, on a domain of infinite extent, we find that multipolar solutions are best used for flows that are unbounded or can be approximated as unbounded. In contrast, when we talk about bounded domains, such as inside a microfluidic device, we find that there are really two different, uh, uh, two very commonly used analytical techniques for these systems. Now again, there's overlap here, because we can have something that's bounded, but where the size of the device is very, very big as compared to some particle. So if I have a nanoparticle inside a micro device, I may be able to model that device as being so big that I can solve it as if it's an unbounded solution. <clears throat> so this distinction between these two can become blurry. But right now I want to talk about bounded flow solutions to Stokes equations. And first and foremost, I want to communicate that as long as our domain is simple enough, bounded flow solutions to the Stokes equations are easy numerically. So if I want to track one million different microparticles, well, that is, in fact, very challenging. But if I just have a microfluidic device with a well-specified domain and I know what the boundary conditions are, and I want to describe what the flow is of a Newtonian fluid, that is a quite routine problem. It requires that you CAD it up. It requires that you be careful about implementing a numerical solution. But fundamentally, this is a problem of manageable proportion. So in general, if you have a microfluidic device that has some complicated but well understood geometry, and you want to understand how the flow changes in response to pressure and velocity boundary conditions, this is something that's relatively straightforward to do numerically. So you can do this in Fluent, you can do this in ComSol, you can do this in CFDRC, etc. We're going to talk not about those numerical solutions, but some specific analytical approximations. And the one I want to focus on today is Healy Shaw devices. And I want to talk about Healy Shaw devices for a couple of different reasons. One, because Stokes flow and potential flow can actually be linked together conceptually through the use of the Healy Shaw devices. Two, Healy Shaw devices are devices that have a uniform but small depth relative to a, re a, a large uh, domain. So the w if we consider a micro device that has a large width but a very small depth, and a depth that is uniform, that could be approximated as a Healy Shaw device. And in the first lecture of this class, I said, well, hey, you know, one thing that's interesting about microfluidic devices is that they're often small, they're often uniformly deep, and because of that, they're quasi two dimensional. And so this Healy Shaw device is, in fact, perhaps the most important example of a quasi two dimensional device. And I'll argue that to a great extent, a Healy Shaw flow device is a historical curiosity. I mean, at least as, a, as someone who has training in mechanical and aerospace engineering, the primary w examples, or the primary reason why people used Healy Shaw devices was to make an image in a lab, for me, to make an image in the lab of a flow over an airfoil. So if you want to approximate high Reynolds number flow in a small device in the lab, it's easy to do so with a Healy Shaw device. But I will, I'll argue that this is a mathematical curiosity. This thing that, for large, to a large extent, has been a mathematical curiosity became relevant again when a whole bunch of engineers all over the place started taking silicon devices and etching them to a uniform depth and then making them have complicated geometries. And the reason for that is that this Healy Shaw device is an example of something that, 
creates a flow that has streamlines that are the same as a potential flow, despite the fact that it's a viscous dominated flow. And so we'll talk about that in the next few minutes. So a Healy-Shaw device is a device with uniform and small depth, but large width. And again, practically, this is something that's quite straightforward to make. In fact, if you make anything that's relatively wide and then create a microfluidic device by putting it through a uniform etching process, you will always get something that is well approximated by the Healy-Shaw formalism. And this top view and side view is an attempt to communicate what I mean. If I have a microfluidic device, I have inlets and outlets, I have some domain that I've etched out. That domain that I've etched out, by definition, is always created by some CAD design. So I can make it as small or as big as I want. If this design I make is relatively large in scale, in this case I've denoted it as one millimeter, relative to the etched depth, which in this case I've denoted as 20 microns, that leads to a geometric simplification of the problem. And that geometric simplification is closely related to the Kuwait and Purcell flow type approximations we made. But now we're, we're sort of, we're not cutting the umbilical cord, we're sort of stretching the umbilical cord. We're allowing things to become one bit more complicated. <clears throat> so if we have a domain that's very, very narrow in the Z direction, relative to the sizes in X and Y, we can take this problem and we can separate it. And what this means is we're postulating that this velocity, which is a function of x, y, and z, can be written as one function, which is a function of x and y. So that function, which I've written here as a capital X, denotes the variation in x and y, like what we would see from this top view. And this z function describes the z variation, what I would see in this side view. Now, the reason why this is a, a, a reasonable thing to guess might be a good way of solving this problem is simply that if I place a geometric constraint, if this thing is really, really long as compared to the height, it's reasonable for me to assume that the derivatives in the x and y direction are small as compared to the derivatives in the z direction. When I make that approximation, it becomes reasonable for me to assume that the pressure itself is not a function of z. If I had a system like this with big variation in pressures in Z, if I allowed myself 
to have large variations in the velocity, in particular if I allowed myself to have velocity in the z component, then I'll find that there's no way for me to satisfy the governing equations. And so we're basically assuming a couple of things about this flow. We're assuming that the velocity has no significant z component. and that the pressure has no z dependence. And in fact, this is very similar to the approximations that we used when we first solved for the Poisson flow. In the Poisson flow, I said that there was a dpdx, a pressure gradient that drove flow, but I didn't allow p to be a function of z, and I'm not allowing p to be a function of z either. Also, when we solved for the Poisson flow, I assumed that the velocity was only in the x direction, here I'm relaxing that just a little bit. I'm allowing it to move in x and y, but I'm not allowing it to have a z component. So I'm basically taking that same geometric simplification I used for Poisson flow, but I'm relaxing it just a little bit. I'm postulating that this problem is separable. I'm saying that there is a function x that describes the x and y coordinate, and a function z that describes the, the, the z dependence. So if I have Poisson flow between two plates, one located at y is equal to 0, and one located at y is equal to d, this is the equation that describes flow between those two plates. As I've written this, this is actually not exactly the same as the way we wrote it. We wrote it in terms of a gap that I believe was 2h, and because it was 2h, this 2 became a 4, and this expression was slightly different. But this is just a, the differences between these two things is just a matter of bookkeeping. Here you can see that there's one part of this that has to do with the variation between plates. And then another component here And then this dpdx term describes the variation along the plane parallel to the plates. And in fact, in a certain sense, we can go back to this original Poisson flow distribution and say, in a certain sense, this was also a solution where we separated things out. We made it even simpler because we assumed that this was a constant. But we had one part of things that was describing the variation between plates, another part that was uh, describing the variation along the plane. And in fact, our solution for this Healy-Shaw flow can take this form and will look a lot like this one. <coughs> 
So this is now just a slightly generalized form of this. Here I basically had a Poisson flow solution where I got a parabolic solution for the variation in between the plates, and that was forced by the local pressure, which is everywhere uniform, dp dx. Here I have a solution of the Poisson flow equations. Basically it gives me a parabolic distribution responding to a uniform normal surface force. The magnitude of that is proportional to the local gradient of the pressure. The key difference is that now this velocity has both a u component and a v component because this gradient of p has components in both the x and y directions. This gradient of p does not have a component in the z direction. <coughs> and this is not a function of z. This part is a function of z only. And again, this relates back to my picture. If I look at things from the side view, what my equation basically tells me, if I zoom out, is that this velocity distribution is parabolic. Just as we've seen previously for our Poisson flow distribution. Because I have a z times a d minus z, so you can see I have a, a minus z squared term. This is a parabolic term. So I have a, locally I always have a parabolic flow distribution. However, the magnitude of that parabolic flow distribution is now allowed to change. In contrast, again, to my Poisson flow, I always assumed that this was a constant. So I always had a parabolic distribution, and it was everywhere uniform. Now, I have a parabolic flow distribution, but the magnitude and the direction of it are now a function of x and y. So my side view is always parabolic, but the magnitude of that parabolic flow changes, and the direction of that parabolic flow in the xy plane changes. That magnitude is dictated, basically, by my solution for p as a function of x and y. So if I have a healy shaw flow, what I really need to do is figure out what is p as a function of x and y. If I know what p is as a function of x and y, then this is known. And if this is known, then I know the velocity everywhere. It basically goes back to the old Poisson flow solution between two plates. But again, my pressure gradient is changing. So now, if I want to pick a form of the Stokes equations to solve to get the pressure everywhere, because all I need to know is the pressure, and I'll have all the velocity distribution, which form of the Stokes flow equations do I want to solve? Number three, which I've stretched. Oh, oh, look at that. It's still there. Right? So what this tells me is that if I know the pressure at the boundaries, I can solve a Laplace equation for the pressure. If I find that pressure everywhere I know what the local gradient is in the xy plane, that tells me the magnitude of the flow. And then all I have to do is multiply that times a parabolic function in z, and now I know what the velocity distribution is. So this is a Stokes flow problem, which we've separated out. In the z direction, we solve the Stokes flow equations, but with a, an assumed constant pressure term. In the xy direction, we were able to simplify it so that we're now solving a Laplace equation for the scalar pressure. And all we need for the boundary conditions is the pressure at the boundary. Now, let's suppose I want to find the magnitude of the velocity at the midplane, like halfway in between these two plates. And that would be the, the plane where I say that z is equal to d over 2. 
So at the midplane, my u is given by this expression, but I'm just going to put d over 2 in here. When I do that, I get d minus d over 2, which is d over 2. This is d over 2 as well, so I have a d squared over 2. So I get uh, minus 1 over 8 eta. And that's my expression for the velocity. Now, you may recall from potential flow right, that the definition of potential flow is the flow that everywhere is proportional to the gradient of a scalar. Right? So we said in potential flow, if I could just get rid of the vorticity, that everywhere the flow is proportional to the gradient of a scalar. I'm making my goofy face. So what's going on here? Yeah. Well, that, that, gets, that gets precisely to the point, right? I have a flow here that's got vorticity everywhere. I mean, there's vorticity like crazy, right? I have a parabolic flow distribution, which means that the flow down here is rotating this way. Up here, the flow is rotating that way. Technically speaking, there's no vorticity at the midplane, but basically, there's vorticity everywhere except identically at the midplane. But in any plane, no matter what value I put in for z, I'll, I'll turn through and I'll get something here, and the only difference will be the magnitude of this constant. Right? So in any plane, if I describe the velocity, that velocity is just given by the gradient of the scalar. Why? Because there's vorticity everywhere, and it's all pointing in the xy plane. Everything's rotating, but it's always rotating around an axis that's in the xy plane. So that means if I take this thing and I look at it from the top, I never see any of the vorticity in this view. The vorticity is all in the xy plane. From the top, the streamlines here look like the streamlines for potential flow. Because if I look at any single plane, that single plane is always going to be some constant over eta times the gradient of pressure. Pressure is always the velocity potential for this flow in any individual plane. It never descri describes any z component, but that doesn't matter because I said there was no z component. If I look at this thing from the side, I see this parabolic flow profile, which has tons of positive vorticity up here at the top. This stuff, this stuff is tumbling this way, which means I have a vorticity that's coming out of the chalkboard here. If I look there, it's rotating this way. I have vorticity pointing into the chalkboard. There's vorticity everywhere, and if I look at it from the side, I see it. If I look at the z dependence, the equation for the z variation, z times d minus z shows me very clearly that there's vorticity everywhere. But it's all in the xy plane, which means if I look at it, and I look at a cut through any, uh, through any xy plane, these streamlines and these velocity magnitudes are equivalent to those that I would get from a potential flow. They're all given by the gradient of a scalar. And so this is an unusual case where we have a viscous dominated flow with tons of vorticity, but again, there's a key geometric simplification that points all of that vorticity in the xy plane. And it means that if I look at any specific xy plane, because there's no vorticity pointing up, all of the, uh, all of the streamlines and all of the velocities I see are all given by a potential equation. Always the gradient of a scalar. right? So I have the Navier-Stokes equations, which I simple to the, simplify to the Stokes equations. I solve for the z-dependence using the Stokes equations. I solve for the xy-dependence using a Laplace flow equation. And if I look at an xy plane, I get velocity magnitudes that are everywhere proportional to the potential flow, again, a solution of the, of the Laplace equations. So this allows me to take a viscous dominated flow with tons of vorticity, but describe it basically using potential flow relations. This is similar to what happened with electroosmosis. Electroosmosis was different. There I took all the vorticity and I smashed it next to the wall, so close that I didn't have to pay attention to it anymore. Here I have all the vorticity, but all the vorticity I have geometrically restricted to pointing in one plane.
So what this means is that pressure is the velocity potential for these flows. And when I make something that looks like this, I can actually use potential flow analysis to design this. Now I can do a 2D potential flow analysis, solve the Laplace equation. And when I solve the Laplace equation, that Laplace equation tells me what this shape to be needs to be. I don't even need to do a 3D analysis, and I never need to solve the Stokes equations. I just solve the Laplace equation.